Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our next session, the Fireside Chat. Please join me in welcoming Chip Block, Vice President, Converge Security Solutions, and Afton Ross, PhD, Senior Project Manager, Center for Devices and Radiological Health, CDRH, Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, Food and Drug Administration, FDA, to the stage. And here they are. Thank you. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is start off, so as everybody gets back to their seat, uh, we're going to start off by just a little couple introductions, and I'll let Dr. Ross kind of start off and kind of give a little background of, of your, what you do and what you, what's going on. Sure. So my name's Afton Ross, and I work at the Food and Drug Administration in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Um, and in particular, our group has worked a lot on the cybersecurity policy for medical devices, both in the pre-market, so prior to devices coming um, to the field, as well as in the post-market. And we have some different policies um, there. We've also been very active in this space in terms of recognizing that um, cybersecurity for medical devices is really a shared responsibility. And therefore, we have tried to converge upon different um, meetings, um, bringing in different stakeholders to try to collaborate on these challenges across the ecosystem. So that includes both um, researchers, manufacturers, um, healthcare delivery organizations, patients, government agencies such as ourselves. I've been trying to really address um, some of these uh, per pervasive cybersecurity challenges. Um, we are very excited um, to be here today um, because I think one of the main things we really want to um, articulate is that cybersecurity, a lot of times people think about uh, data and data protection, and that is critical and important. But there is a patient safety aspect to it when you think about medical devices. And that's something that we do not want people to forget. We don't want that to get lost, um, because that really is um, one of our um, key areas of, of focus in trying to prevent any potential patient harms as a result of cybersecurity concerns in medical devices. All right, thank you. And I'm Chip Block, Vice President and Chief Solutions Architect at Converge Security Solutions. Some of you who know me previous as Evolver, we actually got acquired uh, several months ago and we acquired another company, uh, which was a physical security. So we have a cyber and a physical. And this world that we're talking about, which is the physical, where the cyber and the physical worlds come together, is where we live. Uh, and uh, that's, we have actually done a fair, we do a fair amount of work. We're, we're about 50% federal, 50% commercial. A lot of work on the commercial side has been around this issue of medical devices and hospitals. We are an operations company, and then you'll see some discussions about that. We're dealing with today's problem in a lot of cases. It's, I mean, we, we look at tomorrow's problem. We're looking at today's problem, which is a good place for me to start. I'm going to actually make this interactive really quick. I have a question for everybody. How much patient safety are you willing to give up for privacy? Not much. Do you have a metric or some way to gauge that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe my turn. Let me ask a question a little. How much are you willing to spend on cybersecurity for patient safety? We don't, as Afton just brought up, we don't talk about this, but this is the world we're dealing with. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of characterize this problem in three places, and we're kind of going to work this. Well, we actually look at the world as three attack areas. And it's interesting because I looked at the group that was, that's here, covers all three of them. The first is devices and activities getting something from the wild, picking up a virus. This has happened. This isn't conjecture. This isn't things of books. This was WannaCry. This has happened. Devices failed because they picked up malware capabilities off the open net. The second one is for criminal activity, right? We now have a huge increase in ransomware on hospitals. We have the, the shutting down of devices and capabilities is another, is another area. And the last is militarily, right? Which is related to the actual attempt at physical harm to soldiers or other capabilities for military purposes. All three of those are problems we face today. Not, not again, something that is in some book that somebody's right. It's something that has to be addressed today. Now, there's been a lot of work being looked at this medical device area. We're going to kind of talk through some of these. And I think maybe a good part is you were talking about what the FDA is doing. You guys have done a lot of work on workshops and things of that sort. 
you want to kind of give a rundown of where that has gone? Sure. Um, so we have, as, as uh, Chip has alluded to, and as I was alluding to in my initial statements, we really do take a whole community approach to addressing these challenges. And so we have convened a series of workshops to try to talk about some of the different challenge areas as it relates to medical device cybersecurity. Um, we had our most recent workshop back in January of this year, and that workshop was a little more focused on our um, pre-market guidance revision. So at that time, it was out for comment. So there was also a way for us to start engaging um, with our stakeholders about some of the things that were proposed in that document. And really, that document looks at um, the evolution of cybersecurity in the medical device space and recognizing, to Chip's point, that we that some of these things are now not theoretical; that we are, you know, aware of potential, you know, impacts for devices. How can we even from the design stage start to think about designing insecurity um, based on our lessons learned from the past? But we recognize also that it is a we take a total product life cycle approach, which means that you also have to think about um, the response side once devices are actually out into the market. No medical device is going to be free of vulnerabilities. We, we know that despite best efforts. So how can you start to design resiliency into the devices such that when something does happen, they can be mitigated more quickly. Um, and so that was really what our last workshop was focused on. And I think one of the things that we were very excited to see in a lot of ways is we had our first public workshop back in 2014. And the strides that have been made in this space since that time are very positive. I think instead of talking about if, People are talking about what we're actually doing to try to address it. And, and I heard a lot of discussion in the first panel about culture change. For us, this has been a major culture change, um, a major shift, and not talking about what if, but understanding that things can happen. What is it that we're actually doing to try to mitigate against it? So it's very good, because one of the things that we're finding is this, is a, this issue has, a, has some real unique problems in this sense. Uh, I found out how to get laughed out of a hospital. Okay? I went in and told them they needed to replace a bunch of their devices because they had cyber issues, right? Um, <laughs> as it was pointed out to me, we're talking about devices that cost 40, 50, 60, hundreds of thousands of dollars each, right? And as it was pointed out, they're going to be there. I, the last panel brought it up. They're going to be there for six, seven, or eight years. These, is, is, and going out and replacing all these devices is not anybody's budget. Uh, so. That was the first thing. I was, uh, I, that was a very poor sale on my point. I didn't sell those services to the hospital. They were not interested in replacing all of their devices. So it does become an engineering issue. And this gets back to the question I kind of started with. Because when you start actually looking at the engineering side, you really are making trade-offs here. right? This is a trade-off world. I, I, I spoke at a conference a couple of weeks ago out in Las Vegas, and I, I started with this question. And at the end, about halfway through, somebody in the audience said, well, the best solution would be to create this master record of every piece of information about every patient and have it all available for anybody at any time. OK, it sounds great. What is the worst solution from a cybersecurity and pr privacy perspective? A single record for every person that everybody can have, right? So we, we're, we're constantly in this push and pull world that we have to address. And in, when you're dealing with the world as it is today, we have to deal with the change. I, I, when I did want to, you brought up the COI, the uh, community, the, uh, trying to get the network structured. Some of the answers we're looking at is restructuring of the network, right? Mm -hmm. Segmentation of the devices. What do we do about those devices? How do we actually address that, th those problems? So, you know, and, and I think also I mentioned before these three different attack vectors, something on the wild, something intentionally criminally, something militarily. I think we also have to realize that the answers to those three questions may be three different answers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we've got a situation where there's enough money and time to restructure every hospital that's out there and say, here's what we need to do. So this is, we talk about risk. We quant is for those you know we do a lot of quantification of cyber risk in monetary terms. You have to make some decisions, and I think uh, the discussion earlier about the community coming together to how do we actually make those decisions and recognizing that solutions may have different answers uh, could be one of them. Okay. 
You, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned about the, the manufacturing, uh, the manufacturers, the device manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about kind of the work that you guys have going with the device sure. manufacturers? Sure. So um, as I indicated, so we both have um, pre-market guidance. So we talk to them about what they need to be thinking about in terms of how they might bake security into their um, devices at the onset um, of the development stage. Because what we find, and I'm, I'm sure everyone else has experienced this as well, bolting on security at the end is much more expensive um, than designing it in. And so we have um, our policies around that and what we're looking for and what we're expecting as it relates to trying to des design security devices. One of the big points um, that we are bringing forward in um, some of our new guidance is really about kind of trying to design in this resiliency as I was talking about um, a little bit earlier because we recognize and our experience has, t has now shown us um, that once vulnerabilities are found, um, once the products are in the market, that some of the time to actually uh, mitigate against some of those challenges is longer than we would like. In part, that's just because the devices were not designed with that in mind. And so if we can at least start um, um, for those devices that are in development, um, trying to fix that particular challenge area, we should hopefully see less of that for devices that are coming forward in the market. But what about those devices that are already out there? You know, what are our policies as it relates to that? So we have tried to incentivize manufacturers to be able to address the vulnerabilities um, that are found and to do so quickly by saying that if you're making an update um, to your device that's purely for security, typically speaking, FDA would not need to see that. So I know a lot of times, sometimes healthcare organizations tell us, the manufacturer said, oh, I can't do it. It's going to take me you know, six more months to get through FDA, et cetera. That is that, typically speaking, is a myth because once again, we have tried to incentivize in our policy an ability for them to be able to address it and to address it quickly because that is in the best interest um, for patients and for patient safety. Um, and so that is one of the areas too where we have also um, talked about too is communicating to your customers, right, about vulnerabilities. These should not be, um, you know, things that are hidden in the closet um, because, and something that's only fixed for one customer and is not fixed for, um, for the ecosystem at large. That doesn't get us to where we want to be. And so we have also very much in, uh, encouraged coordinated vulnerability disclosure where the manufacturers work together with the vulnerability uh, finder and other parties as appropriate to make that um, vulnerability known as along with the mitigations associated with that, be that whether it's a permanent fix or something that can be done in the interim um, while, while a permanent fix is being um, worked on. And so we think that that is also a very positive item um, for manufacturers to be doing. And unfortunately, it's not always seen that way um, in the media or in the press. It's like, oh, look at them. They have vulnerabilities. You know, shame on them. As I said at the start of the talk, all devices are going to have some type of vulnerability just because nothing is perfect. It's more about what you do once you find that than the fact that you have um, a vulnerability. So we've very much been trying to encourage manufacturers to work with researchers because that information, once again, feeds back into the total product life cycle. So once you find out about vulnerabilities and products that are in the market, you can take those learnings and bake those back into the design of your new products. And that is important. We want to have continuous learning. We want to continuously get better. And the only way you can do that is by learning from what's happened in the field. Uh, that's very good. And, and it's interesting you talk about sharing information because that is a real weakness right now within the environment in general. And, and part of it's somebody brought up lawyers before. Uh, I, uh, I found this interesting. Uh, our company has both a legal services group and a cybersecurity group. Two, three years ago, they were completely separate. Now they've crashed together. You can't have a cyber discussion without a lawyer. It, joke about that, but that's really true in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons is about sharing is people are afraid that if they share that information and something bad happens, that there's going to be legal situations. Well, that's creating another issue, which mm -hmm. is uh, the operations issue. And, and since we've got some government, I'll give you a, a I guess this is as much a challenge out as, as, as one response, which is right now at most hospitals, and most uh, clinics and everything else, but by the way, as we move to mobile health, it's going to get worse. We do not really have the ability to detect if a device has been compromised. The devices were never made for that. They don't tell you that. We're looking at technologies to do that, but one of the things that has, because we run Security Operations Center, that has become quite obvious to us is, what are we actually supposed to do? Okay. So if we get an alert in a Security Operations Center, from an infusion pump 
that has been compromised, what exactly is the action? It can't be your standard cyber action. I can't turn it off. There's a patient connected to that thing. Right? I can't segment it. They need the information. We really do not have policies and procedures for what to do if we actually detect medical devices are being compromised. It, it hasn't been developed. I, so we've been looking at this. I think this is a Dilbert cartoon if there ever was one. Because can you, being a cyber person, can you imagine we don't generally communicate well. A security operations center calling a nurse saying, you know, this is somebody at the cyber security operation calling a nurse saying, we've detected a buffer overflow in an infusion pump connected to patient so and so. Can you imagine that conversation? I asked a friend of mine who's a nurse, and I said, what would you do? She said, I'd hang up. <laughs> so I don't, they wouldn't call me. What? But we don't have, what would the action, I, you know, we, what would the action be? And I would say this across the board, that one of the issues, I was going to ask this question in the last panel because you had a lot of CISOs. We haven't even figured out whose problem this is. At most organizations, the CISOs are responsible for the network, the administrative systems, and activities. Medical devices are the purview of biomed. But this is a combined problem. This is a, and we have not developed the capabilities to, and by the way, similarly being a cyber, our cyber systems are not designed for this. Uh, I found out as an example, we talk about biomed. If you go to a surgery room, and some, it, I, don't, I think those of you know this, the nurses write down the device numbers. They write that as part of the medical record, exactly which devices were used during that surgical procedure. By the way, they do that by hand. It's written on a card, and then somebody goes and adds it later. So we have the, the there's some information that's out there but if we detected something, what, back to the patient safety question, if we detected, what's the first question we would want to answer? Which patients has that device touched today? That would be the question we ask. In my sim environments that I got, all of them are great. That's not a field. We don't have a field in our cyber sim tools that say patient. It doesn't exist, right? So technologically, we have issues on the devices. We actually have issues on the response side as well that we have not actually addressed yet as a market. And uh, I, I could say that this translates into other things other than medical devices. All IoT devices are going to have a similar issue. The biggest difference here is we're talking about life and death uh, in, in the responses. So that's, that's one of the, the things that I think has to be uh, addressed as well. Um, um, one of the things, yeah. um, Chip, to add on to what you were saying about the uh, the incident response side. So I think we also recognize that that was um, a gap area. We were hearing a lot from our stakeholders, from um, healthcare delivery organizations, that they really didn't even know where to start or to think about um, how they might incorporate uh, medical device cybersecurity as part of that. Um, and so one of the things that we did is that we um, worked with um, the MITRE Corporation, and um, back in the fall, this past fall. Um, they released a playbook for healthcare delivery organizations that talks a little bit more about preparedness, but also the response side as well. Who are some of the partners here that you might want to be engaging with um, to address some of these concerns? And it was also given from the perspective that it may not just be your individual facility, the idea of kind of having some of these uh, regional networks or either health system networks to also to help you was one of the things that was brought forward in that as well, as well as to some of the governmental partners you might want to think about um, engaging with. So that is a resource um, that we made available, recognizing that this was um, a gap area um, for a lot of our stakeholders. Yeah, it, I, I was about to say, that was the kind of the first start of looking at this issue, and it, it really needs a, a significantly more, because then you're getting into also, we have a tendency to think of big hospitals, and the, but the country is spread with lots and lots of other hospitals. Uh, I don't, is anybody familiar with the orange worm virus? I mean, know what that is? The orange worm virus started showing up on MRI machines all over the place last, when was that, October, maybe earlier, last year sometime. So I, I grew up in a little town in West Virginia, so I called the, the tech person there at the local hospital that I happened to go to high school with. And I said, hey, what MRI machine do you have? He said, well, we don't have an MRI machine. It shows up every Wednesday. 
And so it shows up every Wednesday. Yeah, it shows up in a truck every Wednesday. It pulls up to the hospital. They plug it in. So then I said, can I talk to your IP? I said, could you tell me how you plug that MRI machine into your network? They take a cable out of the, out of the truck and goes straight into their network. There's nothing between that MRI machine and their network. Nobody ever, it's about the community working as a, as a whole. Nobody ever said, well, we should put some kind of firewall between that truck that shows up every Wednesday in the hospital. But I could, I could take that same type of scenario and look at mobile health, which is growing rapidly, um, military tactical operations. We're going to have to start looking at the problem as a whole and that these devices are both, they're both patient safety devices, but they're also network safety devices. Mm -hmm. I talked about the infusion pump. I, uh, uh, it was interesting that when the Huspira, it was two years ago, three years ago. Three. Mm -hmm. The first notice that went out did not come out from the FDA, just, just weeks before, it came out from DHS. Mm -hmm. DHS said, guys, this device is a real problem. Okay, it's a threat to your network. So the devices, as they are going to be there for a while, become both patient issues as well as network issues. It have to be addressed on both those sides. So um, I, I think that's, a, that's another area that we have to start thinking about. Uh, let's talk about a little more about patient safety. Okay? I, I mentioned about responsibility. How, how can we start looking at actually measuring, so the question was, how do we start measuring or looking at the patient safety issue? You know? So I actually think that this is, uh, to, so to Chip's point, this is one of the, the challenging areas is because part of it is awareness and education. So there's actually been um, some different exercises and things that have been done across the country just trying to also raise awareness that cybersecurity might become a patient safety issue. So they've done some different simulations with physicians um, and have done some things to, uh, to the devices from a cybersecurity perspective to even see whether that would even come up as a potential um, thought as that might be you know a root cause for what might be happening here and um, I think that that's going to be important we're seeing more medical schools also interested um, in trying to train some of their physicians at least to have some awareness um, because one of the things we also hear about as it relates to patient safety and cybersecurity devices is sometimes you know the physician they want that device they don't care they said it's in the best interest you know for for patients and so they need to have that device and in some cases that might be true right but at least you are bringing the clinicians you're bringing the cybersecurity expertise the biomeds etc together to make that shared decision so you, you at least understand um, what that risk might be and how you're going to try to mitigate um, against against some of that so I think awareness is um, going to be a key component um, for the clinical space going forward to recognize that cybersecurity does have some some patient safety impacts in terms of the devices themselves so that is one of the things we've talked about in our pre-market um, guidance revision our draft um, that was out for comment is how you might potentially design that in to try to give more awareness to those who are trying to monitor you know those devices that something might be happening so um, it, it's interesting because we were talking about the system as a whole. Sometimes the threat may not be on the direct system, but supporting systems. Yes. Uh, for those of you who followed the uh, pacemaker uh, situation, the Medtronics and a few others, the issue there is actually the device, my dad has one of these, so I have to know this. It's the device in the bedroom mm -hmm. that, that was the vulnerability. When the device itself has some vulnerabilities, but the real device was the supporting technology that went with it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so that's been an issue. I think the other thing that is now becoming more of a concern is the integrity issue as well. We now, I don't know if you, anybody saw the, the information uh, that came out of an uh, uh, exercise in Israel a couple weeks ago where they're actually able to change um, CT scans and actually create tumors or eliminate tumors out of reports. Right. So, that opens up back to the, I mentioned the, the three uh, vectors. That opens up criminal activity. It opens up all sorts of other activities of going and manipulate data and create uh, situations. By the way, I think that also gets to a national security issue, which is the ability to either shut down a whole class of, of devices uh, or the ability to change data on devices. Okay to create whether it be, uh, uh, you could you know, 
create the, the illusion of possible uh, you know, a pandemic or something. Or so, so, we, so the issues here get, get pretty broad as far as the devices go. The other side is, is the definition of a device. Okay, I know this is this is a touch one. How you know, what is the definition of a medical device? How do you define a medical device? <laughs> no, so 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 yeah. So there's a there's an actual definition for medical devices to try to help people to understand where that space might be. And really, at a high level, it really just has to do with um, a technology that is used to um, diagnose or treat. Um, um, different disease states um, for patients. Um, and for us, I think it's very interesting in how we also look at how some of our manufacturers think about the design of their devices, because some of them also operate um, outside the medical device space. They might be part of larger um, companies or conglomerates. And a lot of what they have told us is that they actually will take you know, those best practices across technologies, irrespective of whether it's for, for medical or for another um, in industry, and they will make that, if you will, that, that baseline. And that's actually a good way to think about um, some of the design for your um, systems, um, is to try to make sure that you are designing, obviously with intended use in mind, but designing at, a, at such a point that you are able to take those best practices, lessons learned, even outside of your own space, and incorporate those to make a better product. Um, so I think um, for us, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we have very much you know, seen in our industry is that people are starting to move more towards that, whether it's technically a medical device or if it's an accessory that may not be considered a device itself. They're trying to bring everyone up to, the, to a higher level instead of um, having some baseline level that may not be what you want to be, recognizing that lots of things are getting connected in a way that you may not have thought of. Which is a good, good transition to, I'm going to ask a question a little bit, get people going here. So back to the question I asked about privacy and, and uh, patient safety. So I have and the device can store a patient identifier. Should that patient identifier be the patient's name? Well, it couldn't be. John Doe times 100. There would have to be something else to uniquely identify trace to the individual. So, well, that's the thing. Is, is there a way to do that? Because if, 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 if I am, have a device and it's connected to a patient, the faster the caregiver can identify who that patient is and the characteristics of the patient, the other information about the patient, all the information about the patient, the better the care will be, correct? But if it's some kind of innocuous number, and they have to go look up innocuous number and figure that out, then there's a trade-off there, right? Is there a way to get to, how to, and that gets to storage? What information, this is the design that the medical device, and it's, by the way, I'm actually gonna compliment the medical device, I'm throwing some stones at but I actually call, they're looking at these issues now, which is how much information is stored in the device, where's it stored, how, how long, how do I, you know, can it be um, consumed? I, we've, we've often talked about the future world being the, what I call the consumable uh, device, which is the advice, like right now, how do I avoid infection with gloves? I take them off, right? Um, I throw them away. So could I actually, same thing with the device, hit, but basically wipe it out that quickly? How do I address the storage issue? Those are all things I know that in some of the discussions the device manufacturers are looking at, which is where's the information, where does it get stored, how does it get stored, but at the same time so that the, the caregiver has the most information. I've asked the question about the medical about what's a medical device. Um, we all have, I don't, I don't wear things, but Fitbits, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. There's a big discussion about when do you cross a line on your phone and on your, on your device of when that becomes that, because it now has information. But by the way, that information could be of great value to your caregiver. But again, it's, it's in direct conflict with the security and um, privacy issues that we're, we're So there is this trade-off back and forth. And, and I, I just like to start that question, because it may seem initially, well, oh, we don't want to give up any patient safety. But there's going to be some issues there that have to be addressed. And it's going to be, it is a challenge. Um, so I, I, 
I think I've, I've covered everything we're covered. Make sure. You know. Oh, I know. One last question. This is a hot tub. Should there be a certification of medical devices that they're cyber protected, and who should do that? Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting question, um, and it is one that we has actually come up in some of our um, different workshops. The one thing that you have to remember for certification, at least the way a lot of them are configured um, right now for, um, for our industry, is that they're for a set point in time. So you would be certifying for that device for that set point in time. Um, but the problem then becomes there's going to be different things that evolve over time, different things that evolve over time. How do you address that? Um, and so that for us has been one of the primary challenge areas um, and so one of the potential cons of if you did, will doing a set certification approach if there's no way for actually having some of that, um, that follow up over time. But you also don't want to do it in a burdensome way because to your point, I mean, we have to balance the security with what the device is, you know, intended um, to do, which is, you know, to help, um, to help patients. And so... Um, I think there are some different things that potentially could be, you know, looked at or done as it relates to to that. But we have to just remember, at least for what we have currently right now, is for a set point in time. And so, the, yes, there's value in that. Mm -hmm. But just because you were good to go for today, doesn't mean that you're going to be good in perpetuity. So, so, um, so we've, we've got like ten. I want to keep this interactive. Any questions from the audience? And, They have never designed devices with security in mind. Now, recently, they're starting to do what is it called? MUD. I love that acronym. A manufacturer usage descriptor. And do you see that growing? Because we're seeing it now with IoT types of devices, but I'd like to see it also with medical devices. Because part of how you can secure medical devices is when they come on the network, knowing the difference between an infusion pump and an MRI machine, understanding behaviorally what they're supposed to be doing. And if that MRI machine suddenly starts doing a ping sweep, you can say, you're not allowed to do that. I need to notify people and have to take action to see what you're up to. But still allow you to upload those images to the two servers you're supposed to, so I don't even really care. Right. Do you see the medical manufacturers being willing to add that to it and yeah, so I mean, we have done some work, and I will say I'm not the you know the expert on this, but we do have um, unique device identification for devices, um, and that's supposed to also potentially be one thing that's going to help us um, here as more um, devices are um, coming forward with with those um, with those. Uh, unique identifiers that help you do some of that. But part of what we also have tried to do in some of our pre-market policies is also trying to emphasize the ideas such as like authentication and to your point, to making sure that you are actually checking who you're speaking with and, and that you're not doing something that you would not expect that particular um, device or technology to actually um, be doing. So this is something we're, we've talked about in our pre-market, trying to strengthen um, what we're expecting um, for our manufacturers on that. So we'll, we'll have to stay tuned to see what that, the final version ends up looking like. But um, we, we are starting to think about that and how we can try to uh, bring up the posture as it relates to some of that. By the way, as, as the operations side, we would love that. Okay, Right now, one of the things that we've run into is um, is, is the identity problem. I, I always talk about this. We have three identity problems. Most, most people have one identity. We have three. We have the identity of the caregiver, the identity of the patient, and the identity of the device. Okay? We need to know those three things, basically, from, if we're doing the cybersecurity operation. We want to know those three things. By the way, right now, we don't have very many of any of them. But one device could be in eight different rooms in a day on eight different patients with a dozen different caregivers. And if something bad happens, we, we get detected that the device has malfunctioned and we may be dealing with something, you want to be able to go back and do a forensics and say, who has this affected? If we had that, that information, we would have some at least have that capability. Um, I have a lawyer friend of mine, mentioned lawyers, and I asked him, if a medical device does malfunction and a patient dies, who are you going to sue? Anybody want to guess his answer? Everybody. Exactly. <laughs> it's gonna, because, he's gonna, I said the hospital, because they didn't protect it. The, the page, so 
That's because right now we don't have that piece of information. I'm familiar with the MUD concept, which I think is a really good one, because we can put rules-based systems around that if we had that. But right now, most of the devices, most of the devices don't. Even, they just give you an identifier. They don't tell you much at all. So, yes. um, the last question you asked. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again after having seen yes, presentations. I, I saw Suzanne Schwartz at him. <laughs> so she was saying also the same thing. Myth. Just because it can be patched right now does not mean you have to go back to FDA. People don't hear that. Mm -hmm. Say it a million times, they, they fall back to what they know. Sorry, I'm getting off track. No. The last question you asked, uh, certification for protection. I'm a cybersecurity guy. I don't lead the risk management framework efforts in the Defense Health Agency. However, I would submit there already is a certification of protection for medical devices if you look at them as IT. Mm -hmm. There is an assessment of risk and a determination if it's at an acceptable level of risk. Mm -hmm. It may not go through the full right. assessment and authorization right. process, nor do I think it necessarily should, but everything that stores, transmits, produces, blah, 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 information should be assessed for risk, and if you employ the same risk management framework, then there's standardization. It's, to your point, not point in time, right. like an ATO, gone are the days. Right. I'm gonna say that, but I don't think it's true. Gone are the days of the point in time <laughs> Uh, CNA, now ANA, whatever ATO, we're supposed to be in some real monitoring effect and medical devices may be segmented in some zone architecture which helps mm -hmm. to mitigate. Yeah, yeah. But I would submit that we do have a certification, sort of, so to speak, a certification of protection. Yeah, so I want to add on to one thing um, that Servio just said that I also failed to mention. So we do actually on our cybersecurity webpage have a MythBuster sheet, and that um, and that is um, one of the uh, myths that we do have there. So if you are a healthcare delivery organization, please feel free to download that. And to um, we've had healthcare uh, delivery organizations like you said and say, look, I got this directly, you know, from the FDA website. It doesn't necessarily say that. So let's have a more you know detailed conversation about why you're saying there's a challenge here because there might be. A, a, a real, you know, challenge. I mean, they do need to be able to um, ver uh, verify and validate, you know, whatever it is they're going to propose to you as a, as a mitigation for your issue, and that does take some time. But us being a regulatory hurdle is typically not one of the things that that is part of that timeline. Yeah. By the way, uh, oh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, would some sort of responsibility not be on the healthcare provider or organization by proxy of them being a HIPAA-covered entity? many of them go through the high trust certification kind of streaming on what he said, that they would have to demonstrate that their information systems are strong enough to provide some sort of protection. So might you say that the medical device industry is kind of pushing that responsibility to the users? So I think we, we we have always been of the opinion that it's a shared responsibility. So obviously there are certain things that the medical device manufacturer needs to do at the, at the beginning as part of their the design and what they deliver to the hospital such that they can deliver something that is reasonably secure, right? But then of course, uh, the implementation becomes another another aspect of that, and there's some, um, if you will, there's some shared responsibility on the hospital side as it relates to that um, implementation. So for us, we don't see any one stakeholder, if you will, being the responsible party because we recognize that everyone plays a role in that chain. Um, and so for us, that's why we have very much encouraged for healthcare delivery organizations and manufacturers to work together about what does that look like? Because we also recognize that there are some hospitals who are, are of a greater maturity who want to have more control over their devices and some of the mitigations they themselves have the ability to put onto the devices. And for manufacturers, that can make them a little bit uncomfortable sometimes because that was not necessarily how they had um, intended to design. And they have a large range of customers that are not at that maturity level to be able to do some of those things. So it really does have to be a conversation between the uh, manufacturers, between the healthcare delivery organizations, as it relates to how they're going to work together, um, not even just you know an insula installation, but going forward on things that might arise in the field. I mean, it, it really is a shared responsibility. Any other questions? I wanted to point out, because we're just about out of time, I, so you mentioned resources. For, I don't know if we have anybody, people, people here are dealing kind of in this world, but there are some really good resources. Uh, HHS mm -hmm. has, mm -hmm. if, if you're not subscribed to the, I'm going to forget the acronym. The Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council. Thank you. Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council and the NKIC ICS, both those things. Every morning, I will say that on devices, we get something about every day uh, from the NKIC folks, the ICS, on uh, vulnerabilities on a Siemens device or a 
GE device. Or this, so there is information out there. And I'm surprised how many healthcare organizations we talk to who are not aware of that these were. So, the, so there are some really good resources uh, that are out there. If we have another one to cry, I'm sure we'll be on the phone again. Um, but uh, that, that really, there, there is a resources out there to kind of help that. So um, I, I, I want to point that out and contact your local FDA HHS person to get that information so that you're aware of it. So I wanted to give one more plug as well, kind of speaking about what you were just saying um, with regard to um, cybersecurity. So there was, you know, back in 2017, there was um, a healthcare cybersecurity industry um, report that was done. And underneath the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, they're actually looking at the different components of that report. And they have different task groups that are actually working on subcomponents to try to address some of the things that were put forward or recommended in that um, task force report. So if you haven't had the opportunity to get engaged. This is also a good opportunity for you to network also with others um, in your field, but also to help to be part of the, the solution to some of the challenge areas we face. So, okay, so I think if I've got my, my handy phone here, I think we are exactly on time. So, <laughs> so thank you very much.